movement that engages communities on the ground as well as virtual communities of education advocates to which many of us belong. In this regard, BESRA is certainly a positive step forward. Our recommendation is to expand it to include post-secondary education. But comprehensive frameworks do not reforms make. To illustrate, we do not only have the law for decentralization in basic education, we also have well-articulated frameworks like BESRA and other frameworks that are sometimes even ahead of the discourses, if not up to date with the discourses. Reforms do not transform when such laws and frameworks are not implemented. With the passion and organization of reformists, or of a corporation whose future survival depends upon meeting targets now. We need a roadmap, detailed implementation plans, and the organization to tap into the energies of education reformists inside and outside the bureaucracy and channel these to schools. We're very heartened that there are many reforms, movements now, private sector groups working with DepEd, NGOs working with private sector groups, and, and that is a good sign but it's not enough to just have all of us there. Okay. We end the reflection by asking ourselves, what UP can do in the service of education reform? Precisely because reform has been conducted as if in a crisis mode, UP must find a way, ways for the education system to break free from the tireless repetitions of problems and so-called solutions. UP can mobilize its multidisciplinary expertise as it did in the past. UP can provide the much needed research on all aspects of Philippine education, including its own policies. UP can generate and filter discourses the way national institutes of education in other countries do. Thus, UP must swiftly bring together the country's education reformists to work with the public, and we must say, even the private education sector. If there is one thing that UP must do in the service of the nation, it is this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, professors. Our panelists are now ready for questions from the audience here and in the other campuses. May we just remind those who wish to ask to please keep the question short and direct to the point. We would like to have time to hear from all nine campuses. We will entertain the first question here in the auditorium. Yes, sir. Please state your name. Well, not your college, but uh, your qu brief question. I am thankful for the summary of what UP can do. Proudly, I announce I finished all my high school in UP. I graduated formally from UP. And bragging aside, or to be proud about it, I even graduated cum laude from UP. And in the UP Centennial, I had the Jubilarians, the Sapphire Jubilarians of the UPAA. But I now speak as a product of UP, teaching and has taught for 45 years in La Universidad de Santo Tomas. Of course, I finished some uh, degree elsewhere, but proudly I am with UST. But equally proudly, I proclaim I am a product of the University of the Philippines. Although UP may not be proud of that fact, I am <laughs> proud of that fact. I sir, know may it. we have your question, please? The question your is name, this. Please, sir? I am uh, Jose yes. David Lapuz of the UNESCO. Okay. I'm also the Philippine Commissioner to Paris. And in fact, those discussions were part of the discussions in the biennial conference that biennially takes place in Place de Fontenoy in Paris. Right. Let me be brief by my question. Yes, sir. Thank this, you. This, <laughs> Thank constant, you this constant interruption 
can only lengthen it. It All cannot right, abbreviate it. So you will allow me to say my piece and I shall be brief. On this question of education, I reviewed the materials. I must compliment the speakers. They are so eloquent. They are so uh, clear in their presentation. I may summarize, I may make my own summary. I don't leave it to the presenters to summarize it. You discuss uh, the transmission done by schools. You also discussed, part of it is mainstreaming. But my question is this. The fact is, the basic view of education, as I have perceived it all these decades, is that it is conflict-oriented. It is a conflictive perspective in education. What do I mean? What I mean is, the education that we have, whether from UP or UST or anywhere else, what I see after so many years of observation, our school, including UP, merely reproduces the class structures. The class structures are perpetuated, although that is not the intention, that is the result. And the question is, the mechanism that has gone into funding and the mechanism that has gone into schools, some are for elite, some are for the masses, is it not the question then that this education we are discussing in the long and the short of it merely reinforces society's basic social inequalities and discrepancies. And I want the three learned panelists to comment on that. Is it not part of the UP function to destroy of that reinforcement, rather to continue in the reinforcing of those social structures? That is one question I'd like to thank, I'd like to raise. And thank you for the privilege. It's my first visit in UP for the past 30 years. That was the last time I visited UP. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> sir, I'll, I'll answer your question for all of us. Uh, basically, um, in the inequities of the society, our education has really reproduced inequities in our society. And maybe what we are talking about here are all we, we cannot completely undermine that inequitable structure. But if we are able to reform our education system, then we're also able to reform our citizens so that they will be able to critically question and address such a system. I, I know I also come from a tradition theoretically where we look at education as reproductive of existing society. And we have also actually documented in what ways it has reproduced. But I also am heartened by many things I see on the ground that are no longer exactly going to reproduce the system if it's more widespread. I mean, one, one example, and this is, this is in terms of, of, and I'd like to go to the obeisance uh, culture that we were talking about. You can have inequities, we're talking about socioeconomic inequities, you can also have inequities in hierarchies, the hierarchy of existing debt. And, and when you have such inequities, people at the bottom usually would defer to those on top and just assume that whatever they say would go because they have the power. But when you break that power, and one way of breaking that power and resisting whatever it is that keep those people powerful is to bring down and decentralize education to the ground. One should decentralize, and we have actual examples of how that culture has been broken. I am not saying the socioeconomic structure has changed. I am saying you now have potentials for people to question the socioeconomic structure that is highly inequitable. I'm also saying that DepEd has enough experience with schools and students who have learned 
in a way that's different from how they were learning in the past. And teachers have also learned that they can discover and do things in their classrooms, and that's why they can answer back. Answering back is addressing power. I mean, addressing power and saying, this is what we know and this is how it should be done. And if the people, powerful people feel that the answering back is already rude and arrogant, we're very happy that that's one way of already undermining the structure. It will take a long time to talk about inequities because we already talked in our report that from the very beginning, they wanted educational system was supposed to break the oligarchy. But, but it did not break the oligarchy. In fact, it helped reproduce maybe the oligarchic system. But there are many openings that will allow us to actually begin confronting issues of inequity. And you begin by reforming education and ensuring that you have equitable distribution of education services. All right, thank you very much. We have a question from UP Tacloban. Our moderator is Professor Kerima Hobson. Come in, please. Good afternoon. Uh, this is my question. This lecture has opened my mind to what can be done in our schools, especially with the problem of a lack of confidence in our students due to the language problem. The one radical recommendation that has much impact on me is that education should begin with a child's language before moving towards additional desired languages. My question is, in the face of this enormous task, where do we start? Do we start with legislators who are promoting their own interests in Congress? How do we get them to listen when it has not been listening for years? Do we try to reach the public school teachers who are controlled by the centralized system of education? That is all, ma'am. Thank you for your question. The, the the thing to do, I suppose, is to stop barking at the same trees, no matter how old they are. The the point the point is to be the point is to be able to get schools school programs to to transform their approaches to child learning, meaning that it is in the present bilingual education policy that you can use the auxiliary languages. Therefore, we must use them. So if you use this present frame, it can be done. But it's not strong enough. The, the second one has to do with decentralization again. There is a need to empower teachers and principals to make decisions for the children in the schools of their villages. If it is always a central DepEd memo or a regional order that is required, then there is a huge possibility it will not get to the school in the mountain. And therefore, that particular school will not get the information it needs, no matter how enlightened that DepEd memo is. But if a school were, were, were empowered and the teachers within and the community around actually valued what went on in the school, then they can actually make the changes themselves. Just having said that, the, the, the supervisory or monitoring levels of DepEd should be real, should get real, and, and change their assessment tools and instruments across the grades so that they can assess properly the learning of the children. In a recent conference on medium of instruction, the emerging consensus was that the best policy regarding the language of instruction in a multilingual culture is an underspecified policy. So we should not really, we will not be very happy if the, the legislation agrees to one bill or the other because bottom line that is still the government telling the teachers how they should be teaching. What we believe is that the teachers should be allowed to make the decision for themselves for the specific types of students they're dealing with and align with the aspirations of their community.